May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our God, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Please. <clears throat> Raise your hand or just shout it out if you know what epiphany means, basically. What does it stand for? Yeah, go on. Showing forth. Showing forth. Manifesting. Manifesting. Showing forth. And uh, $64,000 pyramid question. Here we go. So the visit of the Magi is one of the manifestations of Christ to the Gentiles in the season of epiphany. But there's always a three. Uh, what are the other two? Get in on this. Transfiguration? No. There's three manifestations. We're in year B of the lectionary cycle, so we get uh, the reading of him being baptized in the Jordan. So I just gave away the second one. So visit the Magi, baptism in the Jordan, and what's the third manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles? You want to phone a friend? Here's your hint. It was his first miracle. Who said it back there? Who said it? I want to give credit. The wedding feast at Cana, when he turned water into wine. You just never know. You might be on Jeopardy like that bloke from Vancouver. He won a lot of money. Okay, no one watches Jeopardy. Okay. I could go a lot of ways with this, uh, and I have for, you know, my whole ordained life, but this is what's... Uh, stuck in my craw. If Jesus is sinless, why does he have to be baptized? It's a good answer. It gets at yes, yes. Just to front load this, for my money, the act of Jesus being Picture it in your mind. Some of you Baptists can get this right away, but us Episcopalians who've had water sprinkled on us, we're going to have a tougher time. When the, bapti when the Baptists baptize, they do full immersion. So you're like a 100% dunked under the water. You're not just getting sprinkled, which I'm not making fun of that because they're both efficacious, but it's just interesting, the tradition. I'm just curious, and you'd probably be embarrassed because you were in an Episcopal church to self-disclose if you've ever been dunked, but how many of you have been like fully immersed in a baptism? See that? There it is. Well done. I'm kind of jealous. That's a, tr that's a tremendous sacramental act to see a human being go down fully into the water, and that's what I'm getting at. Jesus went fully down into our human stuff. Uh, he didn't just get sprinkled on with a few sins of you and me that he needed to carry. He didn't just go halfway in the water. You know, he wasn't a 50% guy to save you and me. He was 100% underneath the water, fully saturated with all of human sin. And then he came back up again. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, there's a famous Renaissance painting of him um, I believe it's Piero della Francesca of him out of the water with the dove above his head and a little big drop of water dripping down on him. It's just a beautiful image and um, it's a day to remember our own baptism, but I want to get back to my, 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 my wrestling this morning with why, why did Jesus have to be baptized? Yes, he did have to go fully into understanding our human condition. And I've preached that a million times, but I'm not going to do that this time. Jesus' baptism in John's gospel um, is different. He doesn't even report Jesus being baptized. Instead, in the fourth gospel, John the Baptist reports seeing the Spirit descend upon Jesus, like I said, like a dove. And the other three gospels, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they do share an account of Jesus' baptism. However, they do not resolve my question, why was Jesus baptized? In fact, when you listen 
to the essentials, which we just heard in Mark's account, perhaps what is most striking, at least to me, is that Jesus really doesn't say or do much of anything that sheds light on, again, answering my question, why was he baptized? Mark, of course, wrote, I'll say it again, we just heard Jana read it. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. See what I'm getting at? Jesus is rather passive here. But on second thought, I feel like that's maybe how it should be. After all, there's nothing that you and I can do. This is really important to earn anything. And so Jesus' baptism, in effect, doesn't have him doing anything. You know, this is a, this is a, this is a nuance that I, I, I want North American Christians to understand because we're, we're, formed, we're formed to achieve. Because if we don't achieve, we don't get a nice little pat from mom and dad on the back. Or pick your... Pick your superior person. And you know what, friends? That's a hell of a way to live. Always striving, always trying to win someone's approval. Did I get an amen there? Where do we learn that? Well, we learned it because we grew up in America. I, I commend to you the great if you break your leg, and I don't wish that upon you, but you're laid up for six months and you want to read a systematic theology, the best systematic theology since Paul Tillich's uh, three volumes on it is a Canadian, Jana, you know who I'm talking about, Douglas John Hall. Douglas John Hall wrote three big books, systematic theology, pro thinking the faith, confessing the faith, and professing the faith. Understanding Christian theology in a North American context. And he's actually the bloke who I steal from all the time when he says the hardest Christian to be on the planet today is a North American Christian because of all our baggage. But I digress. What do we have here? I sound like the guy in Cool Hand Luke. What we've got here is... Failure to communicate. Wow, you guys are asleep. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Cool hand Luke. There we go. Now we're back. What we got going on here is simply Jesus receiving God's blessing. Receiving God's acceptance. Receiving God's identity. This is what we effect get in our baptism, but I've been known to tell a Catholic grandparent on the phone at Hershey Medical Center that his daughter, now a Baptist, does not need her dead son, baby, drowned in the pool to be baptized because she knows he's with Jesus. And the grandfather, who's very Catholic, is screaming at me on the phone, for the love of God, please baptize my grandson. And I had to say to him, I'm sorry, sir, your daughter, his mother, and husband, your son-in-law, have told me specifically, it's okay. He's with Jesus. And I could hear him screaming at me as I said, I, not, I need to hang the phone up now, sir, I'm sorry. But he said, I could hear him saying, but he's not with Jesus until he gets baptized. I hope I'm not triggering some former Catholics here, but you're in an Episcopal church, and we do not believe that if a baby dies accidentally, they go to limbo. They do not. The God that I worship knew that baby when that baby was knit in its mother's womb and will know that baby to the end of time, and there's nothing that can separate that baby from the love of God, not even a drowning in a backyard pool. Do you get me now? So there's nothing we can do to receive grace upon grace. We heard it last week in John's gospel. And this is the beautiful thing about why I think Jesus was baptized. He wanted to model for us what it means to be accepted, what it means to be called a beloved child of God, even when the world wants to snatch that away from you and tell you you're not good enough. Our identity is in Christ. We are heirs in Christ. 
We are a new creation in Christ. It's a new year, people. We need to be a new creation. We can't continue to be stuck in our stuff. We need Jesus to break us free, and his baptism today, loud and clear, says it is time, my child, it is time for you to hear these words and to take them from here 18 inches to here. That's what I've said before is the biggest speed hurdle or a sleeping policeman, as they say in England. Don't you love that? Don't you love that? Speed bumps in England are called sleeping policemen. I told my son in Seattle, the sleeping policeman who got him for a $250 fine going three miles over the limit in a school zone is 250 bucks. Watch your speed. Anyway, here is the connection to our own baptism. I just told you what it was. I'll, I'll say it again. It's the fact that Jesus, when he heard and he came up out of the water, he heard, here is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. How? Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. I need your ears. How all of us have longed to hear those words from our earthly father or our earthly mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it right there. I can testify being ordained for as long as I have, 26 years and 27 years and counting, whatever it is. That's a lot of counseling. I'm looking at my girl right there. That's a lot of counseling, you know. And isn't it true that attachment issues or overly fused dysfunctional relationships with our parents, our biological earthly parents, bites us and rears its head over and over and over and over. I'm, I'm telling you, and Jesus, that what I'm getting from the Holy Spirit right now is to share with you a snippet of a powerful book from a powerful brother whose ministry is older and wiser than mine, and he has dedicated a lot of it to recovering and rediscovering the ministry of blessing, which, which for all of us, and this is the truth, all of us have daddy issues. All of us have daddy issues. And I'm emphasizing daddy because moms are not too far behind but I'm a mama's boy, and I'm just going to give a nod to moms do a little bit better job than dads when it comes to saying to the child, I'm proud of you. I love you for who you are. The brother I'm going to quote from is Russ Parker. That brother is from Merseyside. Birkenhead, Val knows him. I know him. You love him. We're going to bring him back soon. We've been praying. If Val... Russ, if you're watching, we're praying and we hold you and your beloved Roz, your wife. We've been praying for his wife who's been fighting cancer for years now and she's still with us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, her quality of life and the days she has left, both of you enjoy them. Russ wrote a little book and I'm telling you, I know you're going to get Alice Scannell's book on uh, radical resilience or whatever the title is called. She'll talk about it in the chapel here in about a 45 minutes. But this little book, if you want to get your new year off to a great start, Russ Parker, Rediscovering the Ministry of Blessing. What I'm getting at is when Jesus heard his heavenly father bless him and give him acceptance and give him identity and give him commitment and give him blessing, this is, in a sense, at the core of what we pilgrims are longing for. And so Russ says it like this, brother Russ, you are blessing me, brother. He says it like this. And again, I'm going to pick on the dads here, and that's not to let the moms off the hook but you can see where I'm going with this because actually he has a whole chapter on the mother's blessing, but we're going to stick with the father's blessing. Otherwise, we'll be here all day, and you don't want that. Okay, here it goes. Russ writes, a father's role is to protect and to provide and to bless and to establish his children's identity. And maybe your father did that for you. Maybe he didn't. Perhaps he abandoned you or abused you sexually or physically or verbally or emotionally. Maybe he died before you were ready or left you for some other reason. Maybe he made you his pet, delighting in you so much that you haven't been able to break away to be your own person. 
Perhaps he was distant, removed, and showed no interest in you. Perhaps he terrified you with his anger and rage. Perhaps he made you the scapegoat for all his troubles so that you suffered for things other people did to him. Perhaps he blamed you for things that you were not your fault. Maybe he worked too much or he played too hard and he never spent time with you and so didn't join in with your games and your dance recitals and your birthdays and your achievements. And maybe he spent too much time with you, forcing you to become the athlete or the student or the doctor or the lawyer or the preacher you never wanted to be. And perhaps, perhaps he left you in the care of hurting dangerous people. Maybe he didn't see or believe you when you went to him for help. And perhaps he was just too preoccupied with himself to see anything you wanted or needed then. And I hope, Russ writes, I hope you're willing to hear these words of a broken father speaking to you. And he says this, and I'm going to ask Larry to Lower the lights significantly because I want people to close their eyes and I'm going to pray Father Russ Parker's Father Blessing Prayer over everybody. I want you to close your eyes. This is important stuff we're doing here. I'm saving you a lot of money by not going into therapy. The people who laughed probably need to go into therapy. But I'm being serious when this is a prayer. This is a prayer that will set your heart in a right place and allow you to begin this journey in 2024 to trust him more. But you got to get in touch with the Father's blessing. And so Father, Father Parker writes this with your eyes closed. He says, he says, here's the disclaimer. Father Parker says, I realize I am not your father. Tom Warren, I am not your dad either. But allow me to stand in for him and in the place of your father who may or may not have said any of these things Please allow yourself to hear these words. And if this is too uncomfortable, you can get up and leave. It's okay. This is a safe zone, but I realize this is heavy. So let us close our eyes and let me say this prayer over you. Here it goes. I ask your heavenly father to richly bless you in all the places I failed to bless you. I ask the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of his cross and blood to set you free now from any harsh or cruel words that I said especially the ones you keep remembering over and over. I am so sorry. I ask the Lord to set you free from heart injuries you sustained from me or from others in whose care I placed you. I ask the Holy Spirit to set you free from heartache and disappointments, dreads, grief, or rage you cannot resolve. I'm so sorry for any other struggles I may have caused you. May you be healed from being ignored by me or overindulged by me. If I ever made you feel less than or not good enough, I am deeply sorry, and I ask you to please forgive me. May the Lord set you free from working so hard to please me when nothing ever would. May the Lord set you free from trying to get from me what I never had to give you. I am so sorry. May the Lord set you free from blaming me for failing you, not because I need that, but so you can be free to grow, receive, and to achieve May you be creative in ways you have not yet imagined. May the Lord give you all the things I was unable or unwilling to give you. May the Lord guide you in ways I never could and grant you peace. May the Lord free you from the effects of my addictions, my anxieties, and my anger. May the Lord free you from feeling that you have to always be perfect or that you have to be what I expected you to be. I pray that God will help you to see that the hurt and the pain I caused you came from my own childhood. It limited me, and I am so sorry it has limited you. I pray that God will remove from you any belief that you were not wanted or loved. I pray that the Lord will receive and release you from any unhealthy bond that you may have with me. I want you to keep all the good that came from me and give what you do not need to carry to God. My, and this is where you insert your name, my beloved son or precious daughter, insert your first name in your heart. I love you. I am so proud of you. I am so glad you were born. I am so thankful that you are here. God, your heavenly father, cause your life to flourish and be fulfilled in his healing grace. Amen.
I should say as I sit down, because Jana and myself, and I know people in the, in the counseling therapy world would love me to say, if you want and need to talk to somebody, Jana and I are here, and if we cannot handle what you are bringing through the door, I am the first to say, and I know Janice, I'm going to put words in her mouth, we will find a, a professional to help you work this out. You deserve it. You deserve it. In the name of Jesus, trust him more in 24. Thank you, Lord. Amen.